we explore medical frontiers. Researchers have found that nutrients in certain foods can help people bounce back from fatigue. Examples include chicken and fish. In Japan, people suffering from fatigue can turn to specialized clinics where doctors offer treatments based on advanced research. Getting enough shut-eye is key for good health. We'll show you how to get a good night's sleep. Welcome to Medical Frontiers. Many people employed by companies that operate around the clock have to work late and also put in long hours. And it seems that our modern society is a recipe for exhaustion. Probably many of you have come across a Japanese word called karoshi, which means death from too much mental or physical exertion, such as overwork. And it's become a big social issue here in Japan. The government even allocates a budget for research into the causes of fatigue and how it can be treated. Today, please join me to discover some of the latest findings in fatigue research. Feeling sleepy or run down? In Osaka, there's a facility where people can measure just how tired they are. The equipment includes this fatigue meter. Insert your index fingers in the holes on both sides. Then, sit quietly for two and a half minutes. The device analyzes the balance of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is connected to our organs, blood vessels, and other body parts. It controls unconscious activities such as breathing, digestion, and blood circulation. The balance can become disrupted when we're tired. The device uses pulse and changes in heart rate to measure the degree of fatigue. This man, who's in his late 30s, says he works at least 10 hours every day. Here's the data produced when he used the fatigue meter. Blue indicates normal fatigue, yellow suggests a need for caution, and red is the danger zone, with a high accumulation of fatigue. The man's result is in the red zone. I was surprised. I wasn't aware that I was that tired. I should share the results with my manager and co-workers. This woman is in her 20s. She's married and works full-time and also takes care of the household chores. Her fatigue was in the yellow zone. Caution needed. I'll definitely show this to my husband and I'll ask him to do more around the house. Yasuyoshi Watanabe helped to develop the fatigue meter. He's spent 25 years studying chronic fatigue syndrome. He found patient's blood contains elevated levels of a certain compound. Our cells use oxygen to generate energy. A byproduct of this process is called reactive oxygen species. Compared to samples from healthy subjects, the blood of people with chronic fatigue syndrome contains increased levels of reactive oxygen species. The body is able to get rid of reactive oxygen species produced when we engage in regular activities. But unfortunately, people tend to get overworked. When we're overworked, the body can't remove all the reactive oxygen species, and some remains. 
When people work or exercise too much, suffer severe stress, or don't eat well-balanced meals, their cells develop an excessive accumulation of reactive oxygen species. These substances oxidize proteins and fat and damage cells. As a result, bodily functions deteriorate, causing us to become fatigued. When this happens, proteins produced by the immune system signal the brain to inform it about the damage. The brain reacts by issuing orders to restore the affected cells. The orders are communicated through the autonomic nervous system. It's made up of two parts. The sympathetic nervous system encourages the organs to work actively. The parasympathetic nervous system helps the organs rest. These subsystems take turns and the organs alternate between activity and rest. This helps keep the body functioning normally. But when damage to cells persists, the sympathetic nervous system remains engaged, working hard to fix the damage. And even when the parasympathetic nervous system is working and the body is at rest, the sympathetic nervous system doesn't get switched off. As a result, the autonomic nervous system becomes imbalanced. If this continues, the autonomic nervous system grows weaker, making it harder for the body to recover from fatigue. What are the dangers, for example, of ignoring fatigue? Mm. When you feel tired, it's important to realize it. When we feel tired, we take a rest or take a day off from work. We learn to do that from experience. The problem arises when you don't sense fatigue or you do feel tired, but you have no choice but to keep plugging away even through the night. Sooner or later, you get worn out. Your cells are getting damaged, but you're not aware of it. Or you are aware, but you may have to ignore it. In extreme cases, people suffer from death from overwork, or they become mentally fatigued or depressed. What types of concrete ways have you found to help people recover from fatigue? Diet is very important. Vitamins, for instance, promote recovery. There are also a variety of antioxidants. We should consume plenty of them to get rid of different types of reactive oxygen species. Research has shown that citric acid in citrus fruits, kiwi and strawberries can heal cells damaged by reactive oxygen species. Other substances are said to have the same effect. Broccoli and olive oil contain coenzyme Q10. Salmon and shrimp shells have a red pigment called astaxanthin. And pork is rich in vitamin B1. Watanabe tested 23 components found in food to verify how effective they are in aiding recovery from fatigue. His research showed that compounds called imidazole dipeptides are the most effective. Chicken breast is packed with them. Watanabe enlisted 17 men and women in their 20s to their 50s for an experiment. Half consumed a drink containing imidazole dipeptides every day for four weeks, while the rest did not. He then asked all the participants to ride a stationary bicycle. First, they cycled for 30 minutes. Then, they pedaled at full speed for 10 seconds. For comparison purposes, they then set the number of revolutions to zero. Next, everyone slowed down to a normal speed and kept pedaling for three more hours to the point of exhaustion. Finally, they pedaled as fast as they could again for 10 seconds. This time, the number of rotations plunged. Everyone then rested for four hours. After that, they pedaled again at maximum speed for 10 seconds. 
It turns out that the subjects who consumed imidazole dipeptides were able to quickly complete about the same number of rotations as they did before. Watanabe believes this is proof that imidazole dipeptides aid recovery from fatigue. Dr. Watan, how much of the imidazole peptide should we actually be eating? People should consume 200 milligrams of imidazole dipeptides a day. About half of this chicken breast, or about 100 grams, provides 200 milligrams. Other sources include bonito and tuna. The muscles in these migratory fish are rich in imidazole dipeptides. They're made up of two amino acids, so heat doesn't degrade them. So you can broil or stew them, for example, without worrying about destroying the compounds. Here's a dish made with chicken breast. Besides the imidazole dipeptides from the meat, there are other nutrients as well. For instance, the sauce is made from citrus fruits like oranges or lemons that contain citric acid. And broccoli contains large amounts of coenzyme Q10. Please try some. Delicious. It's so nice with them. Is it lemon lemon juice today? Mm -hmm. Lemon juice with the Yes, lemon juice. As many people know, lemons are especially rich in citric acid. Watanabe teamed up with a professional chef to develop recipes encouraging people to consume more substances that facilitate recovery from fatigue. Here's a Japanese-style pork piccata. Pork helps to ease fatigue because it contains large amounts of vitamin B1. There's grated Parmesan cheese in the egg batter that helps the brain keep the autonomic nervous system in balance. The ingredients in this dish include ground beef and sweet potatoes. Beef contains imidazole dipeptides, while sweet potatoes have vitamins B1 and C. Couldn't then we just take a supplement instead of eating? Would that be effective or not? Of course, you can take supplements, but we need to consume a combination of different nutrients. Consuming all of them through supplements would be very costly and difficult too. If you eat properly, you can get a variety of substances through meals. And taking supplements doesn't give you the kind of pleasure that you get from eating. We all have to eat. It's better to make healthful meals and consume the necessary nutrients that way. This clinic in Western Japan draws on advanced research to treat fatigue. The director is Yasuhito Nakatomi. Aika Kaizaki has been coming for treatment. For two months straight, she put in long hours at work and many hours of overtime. She became overwhelmed by exhaustion and began waking up frequently during the night. I started feeling dizzy and had severe headaches and very stiff shoulders. I visited quite a few hospitals, but they all said they couldn't find anything abnormal. And then I found this clinic. Nakatomi measured the balance of her autonomic nervous system using the fatigue meter. Kaizaki's reading turned out to be in the red zone, indicating a significant imbalance in her autonomic nervous system. Nakatomi also checked the quality of her sleep, 
he had her wear a sensor that detects activity levels to see how much her body moves during slumber. The large spikes indicate a lot of movement during sleep. Nakatomi says this suggests the sympathetic nervous system was actively working during sleep rather than resting. Sleep is most important for recovering from fatigue. That's our longest period of rest. But if the sympathetic nervous system remains active during that time, you can't sleep soundly. Light sleep means the brain doesn't get completely reset. Then our body's mechanisms for recovery become overwhelmed and fatigue builds up. Nakatomi diagnosed an autonomic imbalance. He recommended half a year off from work to give the autonomic nervous system a rest. He also suggested an imidazole dipeptide supplement to control reactive oxygen species. And he prescribed at least seven hours of sleep each night. Six months later, Kaizaki's fatigue had eased. She's back to work, putting in about five hours a day. A year and a half after she began treatment, she was tested again on body activity levels during sleep. The results showed she was well rested. She also measured the balance of her autonomic nervous system again, using the fatigue meter. This time, her reading was in the blue zone, indicating normal activity. Her autonomic balance had improved significantly. I'm grateful that this treatment helped me to regain the ability to recover from fatigue. I've realized that it's important to see a doctor and have a place that I can rely on. When I feel something is amiss with my body, even for a commonplace symptom like fatigue. And I would imagine it's also a matter of, it's an economic factor too. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine yeah. fatigue is causes a lot of, um, in, terms of yeah. in terms of productivity yeah. and efficiency within a company, I would imagine it's a huge economic factor yeah. as well. Yeah. So I think for companies also, society too, to yeah. prioritize yeah. addressing yeah. fatigue. Fatigue is said to cost the Japanese economy about $11 billion in lost productivity. And it also leads to traffic accidents and other incidents. If we include indirect impacts like these, the losses increase by nearly six times to roughly $65 billion. So treating fatigue is important for the economy too. Japan's workforce is shrinking. To cope with that, people who are fatigued should have access to the help they need so they can return to work. Otherwise, Japan's labor shortage will deepen and the country may find itself in an economically unviable position. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Watanabe. Thank you so much. Good quality sleep is absolutely essential in helping us recover from fatigue. And here to help us is Dr. Kajimoto. And he is going to share some secrets on how we can all sleep well. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your time today. So, Dr. Kajimoto, sleep is absolutely essential, isn't it? To help us recover from fatigue. Yes, we all sleep to relieve fatigue. Sleeping allows the autonomic nervous system to rest. That's very important. But we need to encourage good sleep. In other words, before we go to bed, we need to create an environment that gets us ready to sleep. Here's something you can easily do right before bedtime. Stretch to improve your blood circulation and to turn on your parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, great. Please, lie down. Dr. Kashimoto, can I do this on the bed or does it have to be on the floor? Anywhere is fine. Okay, great.
Now, bend your knees, one at a time, and bring them up to your stomach. Like this? That's right. And please do the same with the other knee. Now both knees together and keep them there for three seconds. And bring them down slowly. Good. Next, we'll improve the blood flow around the ankles. Please bend a little at the ankles. Keep them like that for three seconds. And release. These movements bend and stretch the joints in your ankles, knees, and hips. That promotes blood flow, improves circulation, and warms up your lower body. That helps you get ready to enter deep sleep. While we sleep, we breathe, and breathing actually requires quite a bit of energy. If you open up your respiratory tract, it lets you breathe more easily. That allows you to get a good deep sleep, and your autonomic nervous system rests. Now, let's try opening up the respiratory tract. Okay, great. Please do this exercise before bedtime. First, the jaw. People whose jaw is drawn back tend to snore. The respiratory tract becomes narrow. So you want to bring the lower jaw to the front. That's good. So I have to bring this forward, my chin forward. Keep it there for 10 seconds. That's a really unusual. I've never done that before with an exercise. It's a really unusual exercise. I'm sure I look funny. <laughs> Next, let's work on the tongue. If your tongue sinks toward the back of your throat, your respiratory tract becomes narrow. So bring the tongue forward. Exercise your tongue and you'll breathe easily. Tongue forward for 10 seconds. Next, let's exercise the soft palate at the back of your throat. This is where the uvula is. When the soft palate closes, it can cause snoring or narrow the respiratory tract. So let's practice raising the soft palate. Open your mouth wide open like, ah. Imagine you're lifting the uvula. That's good. Okay, because that's another one that we don't do normally, is it? So some of these are, are quite probably fun to do with <laughs> kids as well. Because I think I notice personally, if I get really tired, I tend to snore a little bit as well. Mm. And that's probably good to do before sleep. Yeah. You're right. Now I'd like to share some more tips for better sleep. First, could you show me how you normally sleep? So generally, I move a lot during the night, but I generally sleep on the side. So I'll sleep like this. On your right side? I move a lot. Sometimes I sleep on this side, sometimes I sleep on that side, and then sometimes I move like this. Hmm. Actually, the way you sleep is very good. Oh, really? Oh, that's one good thing I do. <laughs> If you sleep on your back, your tongue sits right above your respiratory tract. Mm, exactly. My... The weight of the tongue forces the respiratory tract to become narrow during sleep. That makes it hard to breathe. To keep the tongue from sinking, sleep on the side rather than the back. That way it's easier to breathe. In fact, more than half of the people who snore or suffer from sleep apnea improve when they switch from sleeping on their back to sleeping on their side. When you sleep on your side like this, your tongue is sideways too. It doesn't touch the respiratory tract, so there's plenty of room for breathing. And one more thing, quite a few women have a stomach problem called gastroptosis. Weight and gravity cause the stomach to descend to a lower than average position. The stomach's exit, or gastric outlet, is located on the lower right end of the organ. So, if you sleep on your right side, what's left in your stomach can flow out easily. And that helps you sleep well. 
So then I should be sleeping on my... Am I sleeping on the right side now? Yes, that's the best. Okay. But if it's uncomfortable to stay like this for a long time, you can roll over too. Now, people who usually sleep on their back may find it difficult to sleep on their side. There's something useful for them. Here it is. It's a body pillow that you can hug, or you can also use one that's long enough for two people. They're available at most bedding stores. Put this between your knees and place your left leg on top of it. You can wrap your legs around it too. Like this? You want to make sure you're comfortable. Oh, this is comfortable. Actually, this is really comfortable. <laughs> this posture is really the best. If you're pregnant or overweight, your stomach probably feels heavy. But if you sleep this way, you feel more comfortable around your stomach and your body is more stable. It's called the Sims position. It's a good posture for expecting mothers and overweight people. Putting one leg on top of the pillow makes the body much more stable. This can make sleeping on the side more comfortable, and it helps keep the respiratory tract open. Sometimes, right after people wake up, they feel tired and sluggish, or their body feels heavy. The way you feel first thing in the morning, when you're not fully awake yet, tells you something about your physical condition. So make sure to check how tired you feel at the beginning of each day. Based on that, you may want to adjust your activity level or workload for the day. That's very important for staying healthy. Thank you so much for your time. Today's coverage has taught me the importance of not underestimating fatigue. Our modern society makes it really easy for fatigue to accumulate. And while there are no quick fixes, there are lots of small things like prioritising a well-balanced diet and getting plenty of good quality sleep that can make a big difference in the long term. Looking forward to seeing you again next time. Science View delves into the fascinating worlds of cutting-edge technology and natural sciences. Academic specialists offer insights into the discoveries that are making a difference in our everyday lives. Meet some of Japan's leading scientists and learn about their work and passion. From deep sea to deep space, it's science made easy each week on Science View. This time on Kabuki Ko, we explore what is known as the Japanese Romeo and Juliet, Imoseyama Onna Teiki. Actor Nakamura Kazetaro introduces scenes from this deeply tragic romance. NHK World TV from Japan.